Hi, welcome to the Aston Barclay podcast. My name is Ben Crawford and you join me sat here with Ron Vale, Group Used Car Buyer from Gates Group and Andrew Muffet, Group Used Car Buyer of Alan Ford, along with Martin Potter, Chief Customer Officer of Aston Barclay. Welcome everybody. Thank you. Ron, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and Gates Group? Yeah, I've worked for Gates for 39 years, doing the same job for 37 and a half of the 39 years. Um, it's a family-owned business uh, based in Essex and Hertfordshire. We are full dealers. We don't have any other franchise at the moment. Uh, I'm not saying that we won't go forward, but at the moment we're purely Ford. We are and we only retail Ford vehicles. And Andrew, same question goes to you. Okay, so the Allen Motor Group's been trading for over 100 years. That also includes SMC and Essex Auto Group. We represent Ford, Kia, and we have a Mazda site as well. I've been working for the group for 10 years and been doing this current role for five. Cool. Thank you, gents. Um, So we're sat here today with uh, two senior figures involved in the Ford dealership network who are, along with the rest of us, continuing to navigate the, the unusual circumstances, the unusual trading conditions we find ourselves in. I don't think it would be out there to describe the current situation as unprecedented. It's been the word of the past two years has been unprecedented, dealing from one unprecedented situation to the next. Um, And, of course, at the minute we're talking about the new car supply issue, uh, or or the lack of. Um, Andrew, we'll start with you. How how has Ford been affected by the the lack of new cars? Yes, Ford Ford are finding it uh, particularly challenging. And one of the... Uh, real difficulties with that is the shifting sands and and, and changing of, uh, of of dates and it's communicating that to customers and being able to plan uh, going forward when when everything is just ch- changing so frequently. And I suppose the, the customers look to you for the the updates on the date that we're receiving their new cars, but it's hard to pass that on when you're not being told. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And Ron, I, I would imagine it would be the same picture for you. Exactly the same. The the um the information chain is not great from Ford, to be honest with you. And it's obviously the customers deal with us directly. They don't deal with Ford Motor Company. So we're the point of contact. So we're the ones that get it in the neck, basically, <laughs> to put it mildly. Uh, but it's, you know, like Andrew says, it's changing all the time. It's updates on this, that and everything else. And, you know, we are now beginning to see quite a lot of cars come through this month so far, we're getting a lot of deliveries from Ford. I don't know about you, Andrew. Yeah, yeah they're coming. Yeah, they are coming. Yeah. So it's and it's just a matter then of getting the customers in to take the cars, which is then another whole other issue, you know, because oh, I didn't want it till, you know, end of May. I didn't want it till June and all this sort of stuff. And, yeah. you know, we've got cars. Space is a problem for us. It's a big problem. I'm sure for you is the same. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And obviously while that goes on, most manufacturers are... Um, in the same boat, I guess, in terms of most of them are struggling to be able to um, satisfy those deliveries in a certain time frame. Um, What do you think for Ford that outlook looks like? I know you guys have all got lots of orders in in the books, um, which is great, I guess, in one one respect. As you've said, Andrew, difficult to uh, keep communicating with those customers, though, when you haven't necessarily got the right kind of answers for them. But... In your view, if, if things are starting to move forward, do you do you have a view on when they might start to get through those sort of backlog of orders and you get back to maybe a 16-week sort of order time that we'd had pre-pandemic? Well, I think we're looking at <laughs> uh, probably Q2 <laughs> yeah. next year, probably, yeah, yeah. that they'll be back to, to, to full capacity in the, in, in the factories. Mm. So, yeah, we, we've got a bit of a way to go yet, I think. And are you finding with stuff that you're getting now, Ron, you said you're starting to get a bit of um, stock, is that certain models that are getting delivered more than others? Uh, more than others? Yes, yeah, I mean, there's certain, as you quite rightly say, there's certain models that are, are more available, should we say, than others, and it's obviously having an impact on the people that wanted you know, a new Focus or a new Fiesta, but, you know, and people that wanted a new Puma, they're getting their cars, and obviously that causes a little bit of a, an issue at times as well, but... It's getting better. I mean, there's so many outside factors at the moment. You know, we can all find excuses. We're the best people in the world for finding excuses in this job. But, I mean, it's just, it's, you know, like you said previously, but it's unprecedented and we've just got to get on with it. It's not very pleasant, but it's all we can do. And do you find that Ford are prioritising some models over another? Is that? It's only what what they can build. That's the problem. I mean, you know, they're, they're, and they're, I mean, I'm sure Andrew's aware of this as well as I, and they're taking, because of this uh, 
you know, chip thing. They're, they're taking bits off of cars that were standard, and you know, it's it's going to cause a problem. They're further down the line, it's going to cause a problem. You know, yeah. with certain models, you expect certain things, and all of a sudden, you know, in two years or three years time, when they come back into the second hand market, and all of a sudden, people are going to be asking the question, "Well, why hasn't it got this, and why hasn't it got that?" And it's nobody's fault really it's just you know they've got to keep manufacturing the cars and you know the demand's there that's the thing so they're sending cars out without maybe all the all the features that were yeah i mean this is sat now is it the new focus it's got no sat nav is it yeah new focus got no sat nav yeah and we've said that you know from a wholesale perspective in a couple of three years time when they cycle back round as a used vehicle we're gonna have to be right on our game in terms of understanding what it was built with and what it actually got because yeah, I'm sure historically, if you had a certain model focus, you would have expected certain exactly, you equipment. Do. Exactly, <clears throat> you know, if you buy a top of the range or a middle range uh, model of any, like, you know, any, mm. any manufacturer, you expect certain things, and all of a sudden, when you go and look at it and think, "Well, where's this and where's that?" <laughs> you're going to be disappointed. Yeah, yeah. Um, Satnav, I suppose, is a is a staple you expect from a new car these days, and there's been a lot of talk about this. A lot of talk about this. I mean, you know, some people say, oh, you've got, you know, Google Maps. Well, they're great. But, you know, people of a certain age, and I include myself in that, <laughs> you know, we, we're used to just pushing the button on the on the screen and getting where we're going. We're not linking yeah. phones and, you know, it's it's at the home, as you say, it's unprecedented, it's a moving target. It's mm-hmm. it's difficult for everybody. I and guess again at the minute though, you're the only saving grace you have is that Ford won't be the only manufacturers in that situation, will they? There'll be exactly. there'll be a number of other manufacturers having to do the same thing with with their models. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think BMW are suffering quite badly because yeah. of uh, Worry situation, rooms, yeah. situation in the Ukraine and you know a top end of the market Porsche the same. So you know it's it's yeah, going to be a tricky. Issue. Yeah, exactly. It's a global yeah. and it's going to affect every manufacturer somewhere along the line. Except for someone like possibly Kia. Yes, yeah. They've got their own supply. Yes. Mm. We did hear that BMW were cancelling orders now rather than, you know, maybe adjusting the product that they serve to the customers, but they're now just, you know, straight up cancelling them, which is yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. difficult for the customer, especially the corporate customer as well as the, you know, the, the fleet companies that rely on that product from BMW. Yeah, yeah and I think, I think that that's the other, you've touched on that, Ben, that... Um, for a while as well, the the focus is obviously on supplying the retail dealerships with whatever cars are being made. That's obviously the preferred option for the manufacturer because um, they want to satisfy that consumer. So yeah, I think you know all that we're describing here, and it's great to hear that there is some uh, light at the end of the tunnel with models coming. But I, I, I'm sure for fleets and corporates that isn't the case just yet because. Um, the manufacturers obviously want to satisfy the, their own franchise dealer network and their consumers first, uh, and then I guess corporate and the like will be next, and I'm not sure when or if they ever get back to the rental market. Um, not for some time yet, I would imagine, bearing in mind the sort of lead times you guys are mentioning into Q2 next year. Mm. Yeah. Well, we had a confirmation from Ford not that long ago that they were pulling out the rental market. And I mean, they're not the only manufacturer. I would think there's plenty of others who've done the same. Yeah, there's no it's going to be an interesting dynamic for oh. those guys, isn't it? Changing their strategic models. Because yes. I know we've experienced a lot of rental companies buying nearly new and used as well because yes. they're just they're, they're having to to get enough stock for themselves. Yeah, so that's an interesting change. On the subject then of you know companies sh- shifting the type of vehicle they're buying, going from new to use. I think that's something that we see in the consumer doing as well, where they might ordinarily walk into a dealership, shake hands with the salesman and agree to buy a new car there, and then they're now increasingly looking towards that used market. And, of course, that's had a knock-on impact on the prices of used vehicles. In your dealerships, is it something you see that the, the, you know, the split between new and used has shifted over the past couple of years? I think, there's, I think now um, people are quite happy to wait for a new car. Right. I think where the... Used car prices have gone up so much in the last two years. New car prices haven't gone up in 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 the same way, and and I I think retail is is used to elite time. You you go into a, a lot of retail sectors now and uh, like um, uh, sofas and that sort of thing, and and you wouldn't expect to to walk away with it today anymore. So I think I think people are are 
prepared to wait for a new one and exactly what they want rather than necessarily settling for the, the used equivalent, which in the past would have been a big saving on, a, on, on, on the new price and, and isn't so much of a saving now. I think new car customers are new car customers, and you yes, yeah, yeah. they are. You know, I mean, they're predominantly they know what they want, and they want a certain specific specification. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we went through a period, and I'm sure Andrew will agree, where people were coming in for second hand cars, and they were thinking they were buying a new car, and they were saying, you know, has it not got this? Has it not got that? No, this particular model doesn't. So, well, and I want it then, and then that's when you know they took a step back and then maybe had to rethink after a while because there was no supply for a long time. And I guess as a result of that, if the new customers are, have remained new, I guess you guys are amongst many, many um, retailers around the country in the last 12 months, especially while this new car supply has been an issue. Um, has the increase in used transactions really been borne out just as a, a way of you guys having to make the profits your organisations want to make because you've had to turn to used in order to do that rather than uh, because of the new supply not being there, course, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, we've converted, you know, new car customers into used cars because, one, we need the sale, and, two, we haven't got the supply. So it's the chicken and the egg scenario. Yeah. Only. You can have this one now or you can wait... I mean, you know, some people were being quoted, you know, I wouldn't say over the microphone, but quite a long time, shall we yeah. say. Yeah. yeah. So does that mean you've had to, I know there might have been the odd one that says, oh, I don't want to wait for X amount of months yeah. uh, or a year or something for the car and they might turn into a used one. But from what you're saying, or both sort of said, um, if you're a new car buyer, you tend to be a new car buyer. Does that mean as businesses you've really had to... Um, expand your ability to generate used used vehicle sales has that been a significant sort of change within your organizations because you've had a need to perhaps increase the number of used cars that you previously may have sold uh, just because the new new numbers aren't there yes definitely i mean we've always been a predominantly new car business mm-hmm. and we've had to uh, definitely change our focus over the last um, over the last two years to, to to meet that change in availability as as, as much of change in demand. Yeah. So in the past, what would you? I know everyone used to talk about that sort of new to used ratio. If we go back to sort of two thousand nineteen, what 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 was new to used ratio for you guys generally as a ballpark sort of figure, and what does that look like today? Maybe. Well, we're certainly more of the um, uh, well on order take. We're probably one to one. Right. Now, um, which is probably um, a fifty percent increase on on used from from where we were previously. Right, yeah, interesting. Ron, same all, for you. Well, we've always been a little bit more used right. than you, um, but I mean, because of the supply issues uh, and people like Andrew and myself, we've had to go out there and pay more money. Mm. So we've been partly responsible for the prices going up as much as we don't. We would deny it emphatically, but unfortunately, it's probably true. Yes. Uh, but it's no fault of anyone's. It's just, it is the old... It's Supply just, and demand dynamic. It's the phrase it? mm. yes, that's yeah. been used quite a lot, in the along with unprecedented yes. supply and demand, yes. Yeah. Well, and that's not unusual in any... Well, and many other industries that, you know, as a result of COVID, is it if you want to buy timber or mm. uh, loads of other um, commodities, um, they've all gone up basically for the same reasons about that supply and demand, isn't it? Absolutely. We spoke a little while ago about um, how people are stepping into the used market, whereas perhaps, like you said, there would have been new car, and just because of the need for it, they've stepped into the used market, but they've found that they've got more buying power, so they can step maybe up a trim line or they can step up a model. I wonder how that's going to shift in the future, whether they are now converted, they've got used to that slightly better product, or whether they're willing to take a step back. It'd be interesting to see, wouldn't it, how people... I think that's... Saying, and I was saying earlier, because of the um, the fact that you know they're not getting so many options on the cars that are being built now, it's going to be a big challenge for some people because they, you know, they get used to these things. We and we're all as bad, even though we've been in the trade many years ourselves. We all, you know, when you get a new car, has it got this? Has it got that? You need to know it's got all the tricks and all the toys on it. Yeah, yeah it is amazing what you get used to as a as a standard, isn't it? Very yeah. quickly. Oh. 
yes, too quickly. Mm. And then, as you say, all of a sudden, you know, a car turns up, no automatic boot release. <laughs> you know, <laughs> goodness <laughs> me. And I've got to do it manually. <laughs> but it's the way of the world, unfortunately, yeah. at the moment. And do you think consumers, the type of car they're looking for is changing? You know, we, we keep going through different phases. SUV was in for a while, and then, you know, increasingly people are looking to the electric market. What are you seeing from a Ford perspective on that front? I, I the the SUV market has definitely taken over, and you can see um, in in the used car market there is a far higher proportion of SUV stock available, and you could see that first of all the the large SUV sort of took over from the large saloon. You can see the focus sized market really. Um, shrinking now as everybody goes to the like of Cougar mm -hmm. you can now start to see it with the Fiesta market and everybody going over over to Puma and that's the the, the, the flip side of the the hybrid electric market as as governments in particular try to move towards a, a greener vehicle the consumer is buying a larger heavier squarer vehicle because that's actually what suits their suits their needs more because they've got more space in it they've got a much better seating position they've got much better view of the road in an suv than they have in the traditional um, um hatchback or, or or saloon car and and that's what you're certainly finding in the used car market there are pockets of large supply of certain types of vehicle like suvs and your more traditional family hatchback there's not so many of those because either the customer's moving over to suv or we're moving the customer over to SUV because that's what we can get. Yeah, mm, that is very true. Yeah. But I think from the, I think there's a lot more people looking at hybrid and electric. I'm not sure how many of those are converting because they're a lot more expensive, yeah. and and it comes back to this um, ongoing conversation around infrastructure. So I think people are starting to look at it now and and. and but they're not actually not actually committing yet. And are you finding more people are um, ready to go into that hybrid based on value? Because I know I know product that we or from our insight reports and each quarter that the hybrid stock for us is very similar to the fleet stock in terms of it's forty months old, it's eighteen thousand pound average value, uh, it's thirty odd thousand miles, whereas when you break out the very small proportion of battery electric vehicles that we're selling in the wholesale market, they're 12 months old, 10,000 miles, nearly £30,000 wholesale prices, I'm talking here, not retail. So there is a, you know, that because hybrid's been out a lot longer than obviously battery electric vehicle, at least the hybrid seems to have hit a value price range where some people might be able to get into it, whereas battery electric is still quite a big step change in terms of overall cost, isn't it? Uh, well, I think if you, if you take the infrastructure element out of, of, of buying an electric vehicle and knowing that you're going to be able to charge it and, 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 and what the range is, I think there's an additional concern about the longevity of an electric car because there are so few out there to, to know how well they're going to last and how long the, 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 the battery is going to last as well and whether you will actually see a drop in, in range as, as, as the battery ages. So yeah, I think you're right. And as as we you you know you were moving that stock profile from being maybe used to increasingly used, is that having an impact on your profit per unit? Is that impacting your business in that way? It could go either way, I suppose, couldn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, unfortunately, everything impacts your profit in this business, <laughs> you know. Uh, but the electric thing is, uh, I know we just talked about it, but I mean, I think Andrew's hit the nail on the head. It's the infrastructure was the issue for people. Mm -hmm. You know, having to plan a journey is not everyone's idea of fun. Let's put it that way. You know, I think the hybrid market is good. The hybrid market yeah. is very good, I think. And that's where I think the government's estimate of being, you know, totally green by whatever it is, 2030 or so, and I think that's a little bit, you know, pie in the sky, to be brutally honest. Well, yeah, and I mean, opinion. I think they, they might achieve it from new because they're going to legislate yeah. it. But like yeah. you say, we all know that every car has quite a long life cycle and a number of owners. I think it's yes. something on average of about six to seven owners before it go, ends up at the scrapyard. So, yeah. 
you know, when we've got how many it is now, lots and lots of millions of people, uh, cars in the car park, about 40 odd million or something, mm. um, then, you know, combustion engines are here for a wee while yet, aren't they, on the roads sure, as such? Yeah. Um, and I know we've said that, um, I'm sure a funny thing we heard again might only be anecdotal, but when the recent uh, fuel increase went on, it was uh, some retailers were telling us that they had a bit of a peaked interest in diesel um, because people just wanted to go to the pump less often. Yeah. It was more economical in terms of got more MPG out of it. So, yeah, those consumer habits um, in terms of what suits them um, often is very different to the what the government wants people to buy. Yeah. <laughs> so that'd be interesting to see how I that changes. I think the overriding factor at the end of it all is cost of electric. Yeah. Cost new... And, you know, I mean, it, there's not been that many in the second-hand market, has there? No. So it's a bit difficult to gauge it at the mm. moment. But, I mean, from a new perspective, they are an awful lot of money. You know, you're talking yes. about, or for a, an, a decent-sized car, you're talking £60,000. Yep. You know, and the average man in the street is prepared to spend X amount of money on a car, but it isn't £60,000. <laughs> of course, they haven't got it, basically. And no. I don't mean that in a, you know, it's, no, it's a fact. It's a big amount you know, of money. It's a huge amount of money. And even that monthly cost is significant on a, on a car line up. Yeah, well, it'd be, yeah, it'd be huge. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much that cost on a PC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing that um, Aston Barkley has been doing specifically with, with your two businesses is the um, evaluation and appraisal training. Um, mm. I know that's something that you've both taken on. And how has that been working for you in terms of taking them vehicles back in and, you know, and feeding them back through to auction? Is that, is that helpful to you? I think, funnily enough, we, we we were talking about this today. I think it's been such a different time over the last two two years or so that a lot of disciplines have dropped for a myriad of reasons. And I think it it's just important for everybody it, to get back to basics. Mm. And 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 I think that. Uh, the valuation training has been invaluable for that. Um, it, it's been great for the new starters as well, and a really good a good place for them to start the very beginning of their career with that. Um, but but those that have been in the business a long time, who have had a relatively straightforward time of it, shall we say, for the last couple of years, just yeah, it's just very to, generous, eh? yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just to get back to basics and and the and 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 the simple tasks. Because we're seeing um, a, a change in consumer habit again at the moment, with disposable incomes being squeezed, and the the last couple of years where there was there weren't a huge amount of um, uh, opportunities to spend disposable income, for want of a better description, which has been spent on a car mm-hmm. that people are starting to look elsewhere, particularly holidays. Plus, the cost of living has been squeezed as well. So those basic disciplines are going to just become more and more important. And that uh, and that valuation training has been a really big help with that. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, it's uh, it's worked for us. We've had quite a lot of new starters, which I'm sure Andrew has as well. Yeah. And um, they've actually come back, back to me after the training and said, you know, how they enjoyed it, which is the most important thing. And secondly, how uh, they've took it on board, and you can see it now. When you know, you go. You, I, I don't spend much time at the, uh, the sites really, but I mean, you can see it when they're walking around the car and looking at it properly. Whereas it used to be a quick flash around, as we all know. And like Andrew said, you know, the discipline had gone because it was very easy for a long time, mm. and now it's not easy. So it's back to basics, and the training couldn't have come at a better time for us as a company, and I'm sure Andrew as well. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah, and it's been like you say, this, they've been lucky that the market's kind of helped them out, hasn't it, over the last two years, where um, even if they paid a little bit too much for that car, cars were going up exactly, <coughs> at yeah. a rate each month where it just got, got them out of trouble, whereas now we've seen uh, every month uh, this year, certainly, uh, cap books dropping by a percentage or more uh, each month. It's, it's once again important to really understand what cars are, are worth and... Um, uh, valuing them properly and inspecting them properly because as we all know when when those things happen people do um you you don't make quite as much money on a car that's more damaged than another one um for the obvious reasons this morning when we was having a conversation when he said you could take a car in two months ago 
in the height of the pandemic and if nothing happened with it and you think, where's that car gone? Now, it just turned up at auction and you look in the book, as we all do, and think, mm. well, that's all right because he's gone up oh, X yes. amount of money in yeah. the last two months. Yeah. Which, you know, so we was never really in trouble. No. But, I mean, now, as it's going down, as you quite rightly say, Martin, uh, percentages every month, mm. it's going to be more and more... Well, we can see that with our SIVs, yeah. which we do, don't we? We look at our SIVs mm. on the sheets and you think that was obviously priced... Yeah, before the training happened. Yeah. Six weeks ago, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, we have to get out of it the best way we can. Yeah. Oh, and I think, you know, many businesses, an area that isn't spoken about that much, but um, actually that wholesale uh, trading of vehicles that you guys have obviously been involved in for a very long time is still a still a big contributor to your organisation's profitability at the end of the year, isn't it, as well? And, um, you know, gone are the days uh, I've been in the job uh, 30 years as well so you know gone are those days where actually the the wholesale trade arena was always just about um maybe some certain amount of losses per year yeah um that's significantly changed in the last five or six years hasn't it where they are uh, a big part of your overall profit center and buying those cars in properly um is really important isn't it to, to your businesses yes and I suppose, yeah, increasingly you might retail those parts exchanges rather than just shipping them off to auction, so it becomes a core product for you as well. Yeah. Yes. This the next question then is it's the difficult one, I suppose, for everybody to to answer, and it's it's the the glass ball bit of the <laughs> conversation about <laughs> what does the future look like. I know I always ask Martin to give his view on what the future looks like, and it's always a difficult one, isn't it? Especially as things change so much. Yeah. Um, I, th- I mean, I think for me, from a used car perspective, in t- pricing anyway, I know, and I know we have had a few months of drops January into you know Feb and so on, but I think when you look back, um, certain sectors went up anywhere between forty and sixty percent year on year when you look back at our insight reporting. Even if even if we get back to a traditional sort of one and a half two percent drop per month over the rest of this year. That will still only um, take off sort of fifteen percent off of those cars in the next twelve months. Therefore, you're probably still anywhere between twenty-five and forty-five percent monetary value more than it was uh, thirteen compli- months ago. I guess the complicating it's complicating um, factor is supply, and that's I, I think always the important thing. Is, um, if you, you need to look at the monetary prices, value as well as. Cap percentages cap. all the if time, you don't you? Because economy, uh, we all get into that habit of talking about cap outlook, drops and percentages. You would say and then you very quickly look around and sort of say to yourself, "Re-evaluation." Well, a minute, that, um, but because of that the fiesta that I total used to lack of supply in the new car market, which ultimately four, five years is a old, lack of the supply used to be car seven thousand is now eleven the, four. The, the um, right car and oh dear, it's dropped by one hundred and fifty pounds. That's still a stark realization that it's still eleven two, as opposed to seven and a half that it was. Fighting over it, 2020. where the, the pockets of stock that we've already discussed, that there are a lot of, or anything that is uh, of not of fantastic condition, which is where the valuation training com- comes back in again, that will be that will start to become a struggle. Whereas 18 months ago, you could get anything for anything. That that those will be that they will start they will start to suffer, but. Because supply is going to be short, you won't, you're only going to need a slight upturn in in retail demand, and we're all going to be we're all going to be short cars, and we're going to be fighting over them again. Yeah. Um, so that I think from that point of view, yes, we probably are going to we are going to stabilise. Um, provide, but we could do with the economy stabilising as yes, well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and I think actually that's the point. I think the point Cap made last month was that whilst the uh, overall the book dropped by whatever it was, 2.1%, and some models are much greater than that and others aren't, I appreciate within the dynamics of it, but they were saying that it wasn't actually uh, down to the usual scenario where it's more volume. Uh, it was actually going down just because the demand had actually shrunk a little in terms of consumer demand because of what you said about you know fuel bills and available cash. Uh, it wasn't that that supply and demand dynamic had changed any. There wasn't suddenly a, a, a flux of volume that was forcing the prices down. It was actually the retail demand um, softening slightly that had caused that dip, which yeah. is um, yeah. probably the first time that's happened for quite some time as well. I think the footfall has been noticeably lighter than it has been 
in the last few weeks, and I think it's all like you, uh, Andrew said and you she said about the economy. You know, people are getting concerned about their fuel bills, food bills, all sorts of bills. You know, because they, they're coming at you from every angle, everywhere you go, everything has gone up. Yes, it's yeah, absolutely, balmy, but it is. Right, that takes us to the bottom of the podcast. Um, thank you, Ron, Andrew, and Martin for taking the time to join us today, and thank you to the, you, the listener, for joining us. If you want to buy or sell vehicles to Aston Barkley, just visit our website at www.astonbarkley.net. You can get in touch with me at podcast at astonbarkley.net. And if you want to follow us on LinkedIn, it's at Aston Barkley Group. You can follow Martin on LinkedIn at Martin Potter. I've been Ben Crawford. You've been listening to the Aston Barkley podcast. See you next time. Mm-hmm.